Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. This week we have The Spinster and Her Enemies by Sheila Jeffries, discussed by Dorothea Anderson and Sheila Jeffries. So over to you, Dorothea Anderson and Good. Sheila Jeffries. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, really nice to be here uh, with Sheila to talk about her book that was first published in 1985, and it was her very first book. Um, and it's called The Spinster and Her Enemies. So I'll just introduce myself first. Um, I think we decided Sheila needed little introduction because um, she's obviously very well known as, a, as an author and activist. Um, so I'm from the United Kingdom, from a, living now in a place called Huddersfield uh, in Yorkshire. Um, I discovered feminism in the mid 1980s um, when I was at university, and I, you know, used to read, you know, all sorts of books that I could get my my hands on. That was the time when the feminist books were still uh, much more freely available. That we had alternative bookshops, um, and they were still in university libraries, although still not sort of encouraged as reading material. But I, you know, went off and uh, you know did my own research, not just accepting the reading list given by by lecturers. Um, so I think I probably read this book um, not too long after it came out, probably some some time in in the late nineteen eighties. So yeah, I, I read um, feminist theory. You know, obviously women like uh, Andrea Dworkin and Mary Daly are, are very important. But I really used to like reading feminist. Oh, I still do like reading feminist history um, because I always found it very inspiring um, to find out about what uh, women in the past achieved, what their ideas were, what their their activism was. Um, and I just thought. The, I think the title probably um, caught my attention because it's an intriguing title. Why, why would a spinster have enemies? But it all does become very clear when you read the book and hopefully clear during this discussion of the, the book as well. Um, so it's, I found it a fascinating read. It tells us about the campaigns against sexual violence that have been overlooked, but still very relevant. The start of the fight that's still going on today. But Mainly, I liked it for its focus on on sexuality and as a, a sort of live, you know, actual example of sexual politics in action, um, and how sexuality does have a history. It's not natural uh, and, in, and inevitable. Um, it's a social and, and political creation, um, and also for showing how uh, when women start to act independently of patriarchy and live without men, that they have to be brought back in line. Um, you know, so it also documents the backlash uh, against the strong independent spinsters that, that were part of that movement. Um, and it certainly also then showed how this heterosexuality was also um, created, it, it wasn't natural. Um, so it sort of helped me in my understanding of how there was nothing wrong with me if I didn't like um, sexual intercourse. It was quite a normal thing, um, you know, then obviously reinforced by reading, um, say, Andrew Dworkin on, on intercourse. So. Um, yes, yeah, so it was the first of Sheila's books, and it certainly encouraged me to read the rest. Um, I've always found her a very clear analysis of, of patriarchy. She's covered a number of different topics, but it's a really good insight into how patriarchy actually works against us as women. Um, and obviously, we, we do need to know our enemy and, uh, you know, sort of have those tools to fight against it. So, but first of all, Sheila, I just wondered how you'd actually come to write the book, how, how you found out about these women. Yes, well, it was my my first book, um, and I, I, at the time I wrote it, I'd written one um, journal article a couple of years before. Uh, in the 70s, of course, I wrote loads and loads and loads of uh, two sides of A4 conference papers, which were distributed at the feminist conferences, just 1,000 words each. I was very good at that. I, I knew how to do that. And I remember at some point in the, in the late uh, 70s, a woman called Cressida Healy, who was a daughter of Dennis Healy, who was a Labour politician at that time, yeah. said to me, Sheila, you need to write a book. I thought, write a book? Impossible. How could I possibly do that? I have no idea how to do that. It was just extraordinary to imagine. Um, but it's marvellous that she did say that, because that did give me an impetus. And I still remember that she said it to me. I believe she's now in the US. I've sort of tried to find her on mm. the internet since she was a lesbian feminist, as I understand it. But all I know is she's probably there. 
So how did I come to write this? Well, in 1978, I went up to the University of Bradford to do a PhD on sexual abuse of children in the home. Um, it was just becoming an issue and I thought it was a tremendously important issue. Mm -hmm. So I started off thinking that I was going to interview, first of all, find through an advert in the local paper, um, women, and indeed quite a lot of women wrote to me and I've still got their letters about their experience of sexual abuse in the home. I was going to, to um, interview them and try and develop some understanding of this issue because it wasn't very much about, certainly not in the UK. And then somehow, and I don't remember exactly how, I managed to get to the Fawcett Library, which was a library created in the 19th century or uh, named after Millicent Fawcett, the suffragist, mm -hmm. um, which had wonderful, wonderful uh, re um, resources of mm -hmm. feminist history. And not sure how I got there, but once I did get there, I completely changed what I was gonna do for mm -hmm. the PhD. And the research I did there became this book because I discovered from reading, it was massive amounts of resources, loads and loads and loads of feminist newsletters and newspapers and books and tracts and pamphlets. It was just extraordinary. And I did realize there was a massive campaign against sexual abuse of children, against prostitution. I think I did know that one, against marital rape a campaign to change male sexuality entirely, a recognition that male sexuality was a very serious problem. And none of it I knew, although I'd done an MA in social history of that period, 1880 to 1930 before, and we'd done a bit on the suffragettes, but I knew nothing about this history. Mm -hmm. So this history had either been, um, was never understood or discovered, but that's difficult to imagine because the whole library of it, mm -hmm. or it was um, deliberately obscured. Mm -hmm. So... I realized then that the PhD had to be about this because you know I was involved in this struggle. I was doing lots of anti-rape work and it was ex extraordinary to realize that I knew everybody needed to know mm. that we were simply another wave of a struggle that was very serious before yeah. and was wiped away. Yeah. And also at the time, the book was very well received. Uh, there was a very positive review in the Sunday Times by mm. the well-respected novelist Anita Bruckner mm. who wrote Hotel du Lac. And it did at that time go to number one in the alternative mm. bestsellers list uh, compiled mm. by the entertainment magazine City Limits. Mm. I can't imagine there being that degree of excitement about any feminist books now. I mean, we are in a very different time. Mm. But, you know, we, women waited for feminist books then and mm. loved those books in a way I, I don't think happens now. Mm. Well, may, maybe it's coming back. Um, you know, may, maybe the radical feminist books will be on the bestseller list again. I, I do hope. I'd so. like to think. Yeah, I mean, there has there has been excitement and you know good sales around some of the books that are critical of gender ideology, even if they're not yeah. just radical feminism. So that might be a start of the uh, the the shift. So I just thought, um, obviously, I'm, I'm guess many of you won't have read the book, so I'll just go through some of the key. Um, points in the book and then we'll sort of discuss further some of the, the key themes and, and um, sort of issues that are covered. Um, so it both, covers both the, the theory and the activism of these feminists between 1880 and, and 1930 around male sexuality and its harms to, to women. Um, you know, they had a theory of sexuality and its harms um, that has been largely forgotten. You know, they, they were challenging men. Um, so they were working to change the laws as well. Um, but also to change attitudes and to make the issues of sexual abuse public and political, not something to be hidden away in the home. Um, and the aims were you know, similar to those of today. They had to challenge the victim blaming, where in courts it was said that a, you know, a, a small girl could have seduced an adult man and so it was all her fault. Um, you know, it, it, the exposing the male bias in the legal system. At that time, it was all male judges and juries, so it's, it's bad today, but you know, even, even worse then. And one of the big things that Sheila shows is how important spinsters were to feminism as independent women that were challenging male domination and offering a positive and chosen alternative to marriage. Um, and women such as Christabel Pankhurst were clear that this was a political act not to marry. Um, but sadly, this led to a backlash um, that enforced heterosexuality again um, through the so-called science of sexology, which was presented as a sort of reforming sexual feeder movement, but again, you know, was actually damaging um, to women. And it ended up with spinsters um, being stigmatized as unnatural and, and unhealthy, um, as were the so-called frigid women who didn't participate enthusiastically in, in sexual intercourse. 
Um, and something that struck me very much was the development by heterosexual women of challenges to intercourse itself, which is something that doesn't really happen now. There's not much criticism, even of the, the violent practices that women are expected to, to take part in. You know, apparently choking is now, um, you know, to be expected by younger women, which is horrified. Um, but these women were objecting to men seeing women only as a sexual function, not, a, not as people. Uh, one of the ones that caught my eye was a woman called Elizabeth Ralstonholm Elmy, and I managed to say it this time when I, I was stumbling over it before. She had a long career in feminist activism. She's an, an important um, woman, um, and you know, far from being a prude, she wrote sex education books for children, and she advocated for women's control of their bodies and for relationships that were based on love, not sex. So I sort of looked her up online and there is information on her, but only about her work in education and suffrage. And the work on sexuality is barely mentioned. I think that there was a line that she was one of the first to object to marital rape, but it doesn't cover the material that Sheila tells us about. So this woman was born nearly 200 years ago, but her ideas are still too challenging, which is, um, yeah, shows how, how important they are. So I just wanted, Shirley, if you could tell us a bit more about the uh, ideas of those women that were challenging male sex rights and, and intercourse. Yes, uh, I love Elizabeth Watson, her mommy too. Um, she was one, she was a heterosexual woman, but um, generally the feminists at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, had a pretty profound analysis of male sexuality as a very, very serious problem. Um, and in fact, Walsenholm Elmy herself, um, she wrote a book of sex education for children and she described the sexual abuse of children as breaking open a bud too soon. You can see I've remembered that line because yeah. I thought that was you know, so, so powerful. Um, and Elizabeth Walsenholm Elmy herself was very active in the struggle against prostitution, men's abuse of women in prostitution, to raise the age of consent, all of those sorts of things. Um, her partner, Ben Elmy, she didn't marry him at first because she was against marriage. I mean, it's interesting to know that there was a feminist critique of marriage and why you shouldn't marry at that time when we think people were very conservative. Uh, she was a free thinker, so she wasn't a Christian. Uh, she was a very interesting woman, but eventually she had to marry because other suffragists said that it wasn't a good look for the movement if she didn't marry. Um, so she's just one of those women. She believed in psychic love, which is that women shouldn't have to do sexual intercourse and they should do psychic love instead. Um, and another woman was uh, Frances Swiney, um, who uh, was married to a vicar, in fact, but she developed theosophy. She became a theosophist. Let me just show you a little bit of Frances Swiney so that we can get a sense of um, what she said. Um, okay, so this is Frances Swiney, and she was involved in the campaign against sexual abuse of children. And she uh, was involved in the campaign to get the Punishment of Incest Act in 1908. There was no punishment for incest. Uh, incest was not seen as a problem at that time and, and feminists really worked for it. And this is her saying that the um, Punishment of Incest Act was actually, uh, she thought it was not sufficient, but this is her comment upon it and men who engage in sexual abuse of children. I love the rhetoric and you can see from the way she writes, why I write the way I do. I think it's really influenced the way I write. I love the language. Church and state, religion, law, prejudice, custom, tradition, greed, lust, hatred, injustice, selfishness, ignorance, and arrogance have all conspired against her under the sexual rule of the human male. Vices, however, like curses, come back to roost. In his own enfeebled frame, in his diseased tissues, in his weak will, his gibbering idiocy, his raving insanity and hideous criminality. He reaps the fruits of a dishonored motherhood, an outraged womanhood, an unnatural, abnormal, stimulated childbirth and a starved, poison-free infancy. So uh, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of ex extraordinary. And all of her writing was like this. I mean, she was absolutely uh, furious. Um, and she also uh, saw man as a genetic mutation. She read a lot of the 
um, science at the time, and uh, there were scientists saying this, that originally there was just a sort of female oocyte floating about in the ocean, uh, which carried uh, some kind of little penis organism in a sack around its middle, and there wasn't actually anything that was male. And she said that, you know, the male was um, a mutation. And she says the first male cell and the first male organism, as, an entire, as entirely separated from the mother, was an initial failure on the part of the maternal organism to reproduce its like and was due to a chemical deficiency in the metabolism or physique of the mother. Um, I just, I love this stuff. Uh, this is Francis Swiney, somebody's asking in the chat. Francis Swiney, married to a vicar, a theosophist. Theosophy was a whole religion invented by a woman, Helen Bl Helena Blavatsky, who was American, um, who said that women shouldn't have to do sexual intercourse. And the whole religion said that, you know, to reach the pinnacle of you know, the, uh, the right kind of love and, and spirituality, one should not do sexual intercourse. Many feminists <laughs> became theosophists. So it was a big thing. And I have to say, uh, Dorothea, that, you know, at the time, yes, lots of women gave up sexual intercourse, many became, uh, no, sorry, uh, the, yes, the, the, many of them gave up sexual intercourse, many became spinsters, as you say, because they realised that they didn't wish to be in relationships uh, with men at all. Um, so the, and that's why, of course, the book was called The Spinster and Her Enemies. Um, but what was interesting was that there was a general analysis across heterosexual feminists at that time and the ones who chose not to marry about the problem of male sexuality and the importance of being able to avoid it. Mm. Yeah. So that is a very important part of the, the book, the account of the role that spinsters played in feminism. And they were the backbone of the campaigns, although sometimes there is more focus on, on married women, you know, uh, Mrs. Garrett, Mrs. Pankhurst, you know, the, the missus is seen as uh, sometimes very important. Um, but many women didn't marry. Um, to choice, and many had passionate lifelong relationships with, with other women. Um, so what were the distinctive ideas and experiences that these spinsters brought to the women's movement? Yes, well, the, the interesting thing politically is that at the end of the 19th century, there was considered to be a crisis because there were so many spinsters. Um, the, the spinsters were called surplus women. Mm. And in the 1860s, um, the male establishment was talking about how they all needed to be shipped out to Australia because there was a, you know, a, a deficiency there. There weren't enough women for all these you know, muscular migrants in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, was a, there were lots of spinsters and this caused enormous anxiety because mm -hmm. if there were lots of spinsters, they weren't under good control of men, what were they gonna do? You know, they were mm -hmm. wild out there, untamed in society and spinsters were a worry. And also, of course, it was a problem because they didn't have, there weren't good jobs, you know. Um, it wasn't until the late 19th century that they were able to be typewriters, as they were called originally, not typists, typewriters like the machine, because it was originally the typewriters were men, mm. not women. And the Education Act opened up teaching to women, and it became more possible for women to live outside marriage, get accommodation, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it was more possible to be a spinster at the end of the 19th century. Um, and there were very many spinsters. In the, in the late Victorian period, one in three adult women were unmarried, and one in four would never marry at all. Um, and the, a lot of those women became feminists, not surprisingly, and a lot of the women who became feminists chose not to marry deliberately. A very high percentage of the women's social and political union were spinsters who were the most radical of feminists at that time. And let's just have a look at what a couple, um, some of these women had to say. Um, this is um, Christabel Pankhurst um, in uh, 1913. And she's um, talking about opposition to um, votes for women. And she's talking about sexuality. And she was very, very fierce on the problem of male sexuality. And she says, under all the excuses and arguments against votes for women, in other words, there were men saying, you mustn't give women the vote. Sexual vice is to be found lurking. The opposition argues thus, if women are to become politically free, they will become spiritually strong and economically independent, and thus they will not any longer give or sell themselves to be the playthings of men. That, in a nutshell, is the case against votes for women, which I think is extraordinary. Most people don't realize that there was an opposition mm 
the votes for women on the grounds that, you know, women would stop men using prostituted women, that they might do something about sexual abuse of children and all of these other things. Um, I should actually, I, I didn't read the Elizabeth Holston Home Elmy poem, but I think I will do that now uh, on her ideas about how you should have psychic love rather than physical love. She said, um, for but a slave himself, that is man, must ever be till she to shape her own career be free, free from all uninvited touch of man, free mistress of her person's sacred plan, free human soul, the brook that she shall bear, the first, the truly free to breathe our air from woman slave can come but menial race, the mother free confers her free freedom and her grace. And in fact, I wrote a I love the free from all uninvited touch of man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, isn't that that's so politically significant yeah, today? Yeah. There is no chance for women mm -hmm. to be free from all uninvited touch of man. And in fact, in my new book, Penal Imperialism, which is coming out uh, in September, uh, I've got women trying to talk about sexual harassment, even in marriage, husbands just grabbing them in the shower, all that kind of stuff. So free from all uninvited touch of man, mm -hmm. I think is actually very, very radical. But if we do go yeah. on to um, the women becoming spinsters by choice, this is Cicely Hamilton. She wrote a wonderful book in 1909, Marriage as a Trade. She was deliberately a spinster. There is an autobiography of her, a biography rather of her. She says, sex is only one of the ingredients of the natural woman, an ingredient which has assumed undue and exaggerated proportions in her life owing to the fact that it has for many generations furnished her with the means of her livelihood. In other words, as she says, marriage was a form of prostitution. Women had to exchange the sex and allow their body to be used in order to be supported. In sexual matters, it would appear that the whole trend and tendency of man's relation to woman has been to make refusal impossible and to cut off every avenue of escape from the gratification of his desire. So lots of really very modern, I think, mm -hmm. about his writing. Mm -hmm. And this is Christabel Pankhurst in 1913. There can be no mating between the spiritually developed women of this new day and men who in thought and conduct with regard to sex matters are their inferiors. And it seems to me that that fits right now with you know, the pornography revolution and the mm -hmm. fact that huge numbers of women are in relationships with men who are actually watching mm -hmm. um, the vicious mm -hmm. hatred of women every day on, um, on machines in, the, in their bedrooms or whatever. Mm -hmm. And women are, I think a lot of women say, how can we be involved with mm -hmm. any of this? Mm -hmm. um, and this is another spinster, Eno or Morgan, saying that the celebrate class of women was necessary for the task of raising the fair sex out of its subjection. So yes, deliberately, political lesbianism is what we've got there. Mm. And that the existence of this unhusbanded class of women seems to me to be deliberately planned by nature for a specific purpose. We find that wherever women are admitted to sex intercourse to such a degree that the celibate class is practically non-existent, there, the position of women socially, economically, and intellectually is of a low order. So I think it, it, it's fascinating, and there are lots of you know, crossovers, as you say, Dorothy, that with, between what these women were saying and what women were saying today. You can see, you can see that I love them. I mean, it's extraordinary that we don't know about these wonderful women. Well, it's understandable when you read what they say that they had to be suppressed because they were too challenging. So it, it's sad, but it's in a way it's not surprising that uh, you, you know patriarchy fought fought back against the challenge. Um, but yeah, at least we're bringing up these ideas now and and sharing them sharing them again. Um, but yeah, it, and because I think one of the things that's still taught about you know the first wave of feminism is it was all about legal and political e equality. So it was about you know property rights and voting and things like that. And the whole idea that they were critical of sexual relationships and men's behaviour is is still not really talked about. So, so it's been also a really popular movement, and I think that's something we we need to sort of remind women of as well. This wasn't a kind of niche thing. It was a broad-based popular movement that was an integral part of the broader women's movement, working alongside, um, you know, the, the suffrage movement, movements to improve education and employment, all, all that. Um, the 
suffragettes had a, a slogan, votes for women and chastity for men, which, you know, sums it up, the clear link between the political rights and freedoms of women and sexual rights and freedoms of women and putting the, you know, the owners for that on men and that men need to change. But it, that's, that's being lost. And these key ideas, such as there is a sexual conflict between women and men, have now portrayed as being extremist, as moralistic, as, as anti-sex. You know, this is when the, the anti-sex sort of critique of, of feminism started. So what led to the backlash and, and what happened to the spinsters? Yes, I think I should say just a, a little bit more about what these women were actually doing in their yeah. campaigns. Yeah. And mm, their views, really. um, in the late 19th century, um, there was a big campaign to raise the age of consent because the age of consent was 13 mm. until a, a campaign got it raised to 16 in 1985. And what was happening in the late 19th century is that girls as young as 13 were simply traded traded for sexual use as soon as they reached that age of consent of 13 you know they were sold to men for sexual use um, and feminists who were working against prostitution realized that the age of consent absolutely had to be raised it was raised in 85 but there was a clause added that the feminists absolutely hated and worked against but I think I've got a feeling it's still there actually I haven't checked uh, they never managed to get rid of it a clause to protect men and it was called the recalled the reasonable cause to believe clause. If a man thought, just in his mind he thought, that a girl was 16, he could use her and there was no problem. And feminists obviously realized this was about protecting particularly the men of the upper classes who were constantly going out and, and, and using girls and so on. Um, the, another campaign, as I've mentioned, was about the Punishment of Incest Act um, because there had been no legislation before. And of course, I, ha I hadn't realized that a lot of people don't understand about incest and certainly didn't when I was teaching in the 1980s. I remember mentioning the Punishment of Incest Act. Um, I was teaching history. I can't remember why I mentioned it. And when I went out of the room, a girl followed me out, she was probably 17 years old, and she said to me, is incest illegal? So it was very, very clear what was mm. happening to her. So even though the feminist campaign for this act and the act is out there, it's still not even known about. We actually need to be telling girls some of these things mm. that are very, very important to them. Mm. And the women, as you've said before, they campaign for a women's police service. Um, and the women's police service originally was set up by two lesbians, Margaret Damer Dawson and Nina Boyle. In 1914, Nina Boyle was very important. She said she was involved in setting up Save the Children um, and working against prostitution in brothels with girls in them, imprisoned in them in, in Africa and Asia and so on. Um, and when they wanted women uh, magistrates and women police as well. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they talked about how if a girl of you know 12 years old said she'd been raped by uh, a boy in the courtroom, she would be laughed at by rude village boys and be all on her own and be expected to describe what happened to her. And the feminist said she needed a woman's lap to sit on. Um, they, and when a feminist campaign for bigger punishments for rape, sexual abuse and, and girls uh, and so on. So it was, so it was so big, how did it stop? And that's what I was asking myself and what it became very clear to me from this same library was that the campaign against these women um, uh, was a, um, involved a total change in the sexual rules, really. The, the, psych, the uh, sexologists, the scientists of sex in the late 19th century were absolutely pitted against the feminist analysis. They said no male sexuality is inevi inevitably violent, dominating, it's biological, there is absolutely no, nothing you can do about it. Women must submit, women must consent, women must enjoy what is done to them. This is the new science, it must happen. And it was those ideas um, that were behind what was called the first sexual revolution of the 20th century. Um, historians in writing the history of sexuality, of course, have nothing about a feminist perspective at all. Um, and what they generally say is that there were two sexual revolutions in the 20th century, both of which were very, very positive uh, because they were both about women's sexual pleasure. They were both mainly about the liberation of women. And of course, what I discovered 
about the 1920s sexual revolution, what these men were really ab uh, about and seeking to achieve was the very, very opposite of this. And of course, I wrote Spencer and Her Enemies about that revolution. Then my 1990 book, Anticlimax, is about the sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s and how that was about the liberation of men's prostitution, mm -hmm. pornography, sexual use of women, sexual perversions, and, and, and so on, and so on. Um, so, it was, it was a very, very powerful campaign. Um, I, I think I'll just leave it there for the moment. You, you have want to say something, Dorothea, about the sexology? Yeah, um, I mean, I think what, what your experience has shown and, you know, what we still know about what's happening to, to girls and young women out there, that changing the law isn't enough. It does always need to involve changing yeah, attitudes and, and behaviour as well, because I think that, that story you tell about that that young woman that spoke to you is is tragic, you, you know, that, uh, she, you know, she still didn't know, wasn't, you know, sort of able to, to challenge what was happening to her. So it was very much the campaigns weren't just about changing the law, they wanted to change men's behaviour. Um, you know, it was expected that men just had a, an entitlement to, um, to, to, you know, use women sexually as they as they wanted, and there was no challenge to that. Um, so it, what it seemed to me is that the, the work of the sexologists shifted the focus in talking about sexuality from changing men to changing women. So these women were challenging the male sex right and said so that had to be stopped and these women had to be changed so that they would accept the male sex right and accept whatever men wanted to do to them. So in the 19th century, it didn't really matter whether women enjoyed sex or not, that wasn't important. In the 20th century, the idea of these uh, sexologists decided that if women didn't enjoy intercourse, they must be ill, you know, either physically, psychologically, but, you know, sort of wrong, they're wrong in some way and they need to be fixed. Um, and the label that they, uh, that they invented to sort of target these women and stigmatize them was frigid. That wasn't heard of before then because, you know, there wasn't an expectation to, to participate. Um, so the frigid woman was demonized and, you know, it was a terrible thing to be and you had to learn to be an enthusi enthusiastic participant. And it also kind of reinforced the ideas that men must be sexually sort of active and dominant and, you know, women must just sort of lie back and, and be submissive. Um, you know, absolutely no chance of getting any sort of sexuality that was actually defined by women for women. To, to look at what women might what might want out of it. Uh, and alongside that, they were coming up with, you know, the, the word lesbian, they, they took and they defined it in particular ways um, as a, you know, as a, as a stereotype, as a sort of deviant and fixed identity. But again, it was totally based on their male ideas of masculine acting women, um, which again, had nothing to do with the actual lives and experience of women who loved women. Um, but it was used very much to to undermine them and, and sort of portray them as, again, as sick. Y you know, it was a, it became a sickness rather than a, a positive, life affirming um, way, way of living. So the definitions and concepts of both the, the lesbian and the heterosexual woman have been created by sexologists. And they were still influential when I was a, a young woman in the 1980s. You know, that's how that's how lesbians were seen. Um, you know, there was still the idea of being frigid if you, you know, if you, if you didn't have a, a vaginal orgasm, although, although there was obviously books around, like, like the myth of the vaginal orgasm, um, that were start, you know, were informing women that, that you know, yeah, it's a myth. Um, but it was, yeah, it was still around. And so they did an incredible amount of, of damage to not just to feminism, but I think to women generally. But I wondered how these changes in sort of how sexuality and, and women were seen actually contributed to the decline of militant feminism after women got the vote. Well, um, women didn't get the vote until a part of women got the vote in 1918, of course, in yeah. the UK and, and, and another tranche in 1928. Um, but what's very clear from the writings of the anti-feminists and the sexologists was certainly a powerful part of that mm. before the First World War and particularly after the First World War, mm. is that they believed that women had to be penetrated in order to prevent feminism 
And they made that really, really clear and said that if women were not penetrated, women who hadn't been penetrated grew up to be sort of dangerous and cranks and started all kinds of terrible movements. Of course, they included things like, you know, movements to save um, animals and birds, which were all sort of created by feminists and spinsters and and so on at that time. So they thought that they, they saw all these terrible cranks. Um, had not been penetrated. So they understood the penetration of women to actually conquer them Mm -hmm. and prevent their rebellion. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a a really, really um, important insight. Mm -hmm. Um, They also considered that what was crucially necessary is that the the women would not just be penetrated, but they must be. All women must Mm -hmm. be penetrated. And, and in fact, some sexologists at the time were saying this is a very serious problem because, you know, there's so many women and there aren't many men. So how are we going to do this? We can't get all the women married. We just have to, you know, assign, you know, half a dozen women to a particular man or, or whatever and make sure that they all get penetrated because it's so absolutely crucial that they do. And remember, this is in response to a movement by women saying they did not wish to be penetrated. Mm. They actually really, really, really didn't wish to be penetrated. Mm. So, yes, it it was terribly worrying that women weren't getting penetrated, but particularly because these men um, understood that if women had a sexual response, particularly if they had an orgasm, in response to being penetrated by men, then their subordination would be secured Mm -hmm. uh, because they would be eroticizing, loving their own oppression. They would be accepting it, loving it, getting pleasure from it as long as they had that sexual response. Mm -hmm. And the sexologists were tremendously, tremendously worried. Whereas in the 19th century, it was expected that women wouldn't have a sexual response and nobody was worried about that. But by the 1920s, remember this is after the Second World, uh, the First World War, Mm -hmm. women had gone out in the First World War onto the battlefield. They'd been driving ambulances. Mm -hmm. um, They'd been working in factories. They'd been earning good money. So generally, women were seen as potentially very liberated after the First World War, and that was a very, very serious threat as well. So women needed to be put back, put back into the home, penetrated, forced to have some kind of sexual response in order to make them um, less dangerous as a threat. So let's just uh, have a look at um, a couple of quotes from that time. Um, And this is, you can see where the title of my book comes from, a woman called Charlotte Haldane, who was an anti-feminist of the 1920s, wrote a book called Motherhood and Its Enemies. And of course, the enemies were feminists. Uh, Charlotte Haldane was married to a scientist called Haldane. Uh, She had been a feminist. She had, in fact, been a school headmistress and she'd been you know, giving lectures to her girls about going out into the world and being feminist. And then she um, took an absolute back step in the 1920s. She married her, this, this presumably dreadful man and realized the error of her ways and wrote against feminism. And who were the enemies of motherhood? Well, you see here she's this, um, uh, talking about the women, the, the sort of free women created by the First World War. She's actually talking about lesbians, though she doesn't use that word. She says, the war working type of woman, aping the cropped hair, the great booted feet, the grim jaw, the uniform, and if possible, the medals of the military man. If this type had been transitory, its usefulness might be accorded. But it's it's not uh, but it's not doubt not doubtful that in the long run we shall have to regret its social and political influence much as we may applaud its wartime works. So she was attacking those women who achieved a kind of liberation, a decent salary even. And when she's, I realize when I'm reading this um, paragraph, what it really reminds me of is those two women who set up the women's police force in about um, 1913. They looked exactly like this. Mm. Yes, they they had the uniform. They would have liked the medals. I'm not sure if they did. The two Mm. lesbians, Margaret Damer Dawson and Nina Boyle and and so on, in photographs, they look exactly like this. So even just before the First World War, Mm. there were women going out there being lesbians and being extremely worrying, um, liberated women. So these, these are the women 
the sort of women who were really, really frightening. Mm. And there were lots of popularizers of these um, sexology ideas um, and anti-feminist ideas at the time. Charlotte Haldane is only one of them, but I thought her, her book title was so wonderful that I needed to use it in my book mm. title. Now, the, the, the sexologists themselves and what they were requiring of women, well, in the 1920s, they invented the idea of the frigid woman. They didn't need that idea before because women weren't expected to have an enthusiastic sexual response. By the 20s, they must have that because it's the way to make sure that they're properly um, subordinated. So if we just look at one of these men, this is Wilhelm Steckel, who's a Freudian analyst, um, and he's writing about independent women. He, he wrote a book in two parts, it's called Frigidity in Woman in Relation to Her Love Life. It's 1926, two volumes. So you can see how scared they were, these men, what a very serious social problem they were talking about and trying to resolve. And this is Stiegel, he says, she wishes to dominate and is afraid to submit. Orgasm means to give in, to be the weaker one, to acknowledge the man as master. This type is keeping back the orgasm because of pride. She plays the she man, there you are again, there's the lesbian, trying to imitate the habits, qualities, dress and sporting qualities and even the shortcomings of men smoking, for goodness sake. I mean, yes, there were some women who were smoking in the 1920s. Drinking, fighting, and the like. She hates motherhood. She despises nursing, is afraid of giving birth, of labor pains, and she tries to suppress her monthly period. I don't know anything about that or um, what that meant historically. But you can see these, these men's very, very serious alarm. Mm. They were really, really very worried. Mm. Um, and there were large numbers of them. I mean, I was just astonished. I, what I was astonished by is their absolute straightforwardness. Mm. The, the fact they made it very clear that they considered mm. women's sexual pleasure would subordinate her, mm. that they hated feminism. I don't mm. think they thought that their books would ever be written by women, quite honestly. They thought they would mm. be written by, read by doctors uh, mm. and so on. Mm. But they, it was so straightforward. I don't mm. think it's as so straightforward now. I, I think that the, the backlash against feminists and, and sexologists uh, realized that they have to be, um, a little uh, more careful. Mm. Yeah. I mean, when I reread the book, um, I, I was really struck by how um, th there were so many resonances between what was done to feminists at that time and some of the tools and techniques that have been used against feminism in the more recent um, and current backlashes and attacks we're, we're, we're living through. Um, you know, the replacement of a political feminism with a kind of welfare social work type feminism, which has been seen in the way that, um, you know, rape crisis centres and refuges that were set up as a political um, response, um, sort of just became state funded and had all the politics taken out of them. Um, I mean, that certainly happened with a, a local women's centre that, that I was in, involved in. Um, but the thing that really just sort of stood out was the use of pseudoscientific ideas. I mean, Sheila's just run through these things. I mean, they, they sound absolutely outrageous, but these men were claiming that this was science. This was definitely, you know, it was proved. But, you know, it was no more proved than the, you know, ridiculous idea of, of a gender identity that we've been presented with now that is also being presented as some kind of scientific truth when it's just been, yeah, I don't know where they dreamt it up from. But, um, you know, the, 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 but again, the same thing very much, it's based on establishing male sexual rights, you, you know, that some men, you know, get, get aroused by the thoughts of themselves as, as a woman. So therefore we all have to accept that they have a, a, you know, a female gender identity and, you know, that it's okay for them to tend to be women. Um, you know, it's another attack on, on, on women. And again, of course, lesbians are the main target. So lesbians are the ultimate threat to patriarchy. And so they have to be brought down in any way that's possible. So now again, we have the completely offensive, um, you know, re redefinition of what a lesbian is and the ridiculous suggestion that lesbians should want to have sex with, with these men, which is 
yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure everybody here knows how appalling it is. I don't, I don't need to tell you that. That's that's why you're here. But just the parallels, are just sort of a sort of a bit of a, you know, like we've just been trapped to get, you know, that every time, you know, two steps forward, one, one step back or, or, or whatever. Um, now, when you wrote, when it was republished in 1997, you wrote a, a new um uh, preface because that was you know within the midst of the um uh queer backlash against feminism because one of the things that struck me when i was actually reading the book was she was optimistic about well yes all these terrible things happen but now we've got a strong women's liberation movement and and we're, we're pushing forward which of course it did it made tremendous gains but you know perhaps not um you know as, as much as as we hoped so I just wondered if you were going to write a new preface if you know if this is reissued um for the, the new generation of feminists what would you want to put in well I think it's, it's interesting that yes that the book in 1985 is optimistic because you know in the early 1980s when I've been writing it we had a very strong women's movement we had a really strong movement against violence against women and I thought I was just you know filling in the bit of the history but mm -hmm. the carry on the extraordinary thing is we thought it would carry on mm. but we were very wrong and in 1997 when it, the book was republished um, by spin effects and I did a new preface to it I I still thought um, I still was I was a little bit optimistic I mean I knew there was a huge backlash against us but it hadn't gone feminism hadn't disappeared people still knew about it those campaigns against violence mm. against women were still taking place mm. um, and I remember that I um, in that in that preface I did write about the fact that the um, the lesbian said um, um, uh, uh Gail Rubin had written a piece in which she included me in 1984, in which she said that, you know, I was one of those who criticized the sexologists and how dreadful that was because the sexologists, mm. you know, about freedom. Um, and she was very, very critical and saw me as anti-sex and so on. So I knew something was happening. The so-called feminist sex wars had happened in the, in the late 1980s, which is when a lesbian sadomasochist movement attacked feminism and por supposed pornography for lesbians was created by some women. There was a huge fight over the meaning of sexuality and whether we should be critical or whether we should just accept that everything sex is, is natural, innate, how it should be. So you either were pro-sex, meaning pro all of that, or you were anti-sex if you were a feminist and you had an, any kind of critique. So that was all happening um, in the late eighties. And in the end, I think that's a, a, a hugely um, what led to the defeat of, of feminism at that time, although there was a backlash in many other ways. So mm -hmm. in 97, I still thought, I think, I didn't know everything would go. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I did not know that I would have to grieve and cry about the disappearance of everything that we had created and loved, all the spaces and the institutions and the campaigns and the politics and the ethics and the communities. I didn't know that was going to happen because well, that wasn't quite there. But I think if there was um, a new preface now, it would have to acknowledge that the backlash of the 80s and 90s was completely successful and it was so much so successful that all of these things were wiped out. We were seen as anti-sex prudes. Um, and now it was so successful, the, the backlash eventually, that young women now are afraid to call themselves lesbians. Mm -hmm. The books were, that were written in those days were exclude, are excluded now from university courses and libraries, so the students never come across them. Mm -hmm. We have been wiped from the map, and I really didn't understand that in 1997 that would happen. Mm -hmm. However, I don't want to be totally pessimistic, there is a revival. <laughs> this webinar is a part of that revival. And there is now a new wave of feminists who are interested in our history and in recovering our ideas. Mm. Yeah, which is, which is excellent. Um, one of the aspects of the backlash was something that was called new feminism uh, in the 1920s. Um, which, surprise, surprise, wasn't really feminist. Um, it was, uh, you know, the idea that marriage and domesticity and motherhood were inevitable. Um, so the best that feminist campaigns could do were to challenge, um, you know, to challenge that, but to concentrate on making it a little bit easier. So uh, campaigns, for instance, for family allowances, which obviously is good to give uh, women money, but it's better to get them out of a bad situation. But it was the start of women dismissing 
um, pre-war feminist campaigns as outdated and not relevant to the lives of, of most women. And that, you know, as you said, that the, you know, it was challenges to sexuality were motivated by being anti-sex rather than being anti-harmful sex. And I just, you know, it seems to be the start of the, you know, sort of idea of waves of feminism. Um, so I just wondered what you thought about that, that kind of new feminism and, and the idea that feminism comes in waves. Well, um, in terms of feminism coming in waves, I think uh, that um, re the reason women have said, well, you, the wave theory is wrong. One of the reasons is that they've, they've pointed out that feminism is always there somewhere. There's always a little reservoir of feminism somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not completely sure that's true. I mean, in, in theory, um, those talking about um, how you know, there wasn't a complete backlash against the mm. women's liberation movement, say, well, look, there are shelters, there are refuge, uh, there's refugees, there's rape crisis centers, mm. there's all of those things. And it's in those spaces that the reservoir of feminism will be so that it can burst out and create mm. a new wa uh, wave mm. later on, which is not a completely new wave. But um, I, it seems to me that something a bit like the creation of new welfare feminism in the 1920s did happen. I mean, welfare feminism was about, you know, saying that we need to help women and children. We're very nice women. We just want to help women and children. We aren't those nasty little feminists who, you know, shrieked about the nastiness of male sexuality. Um, welfare feminism included things like saying that there should be child benefits so that women had some money to help them bring up their children. And in fact, it was um, a lesbian involved in that, Eleanor Rathbone, very important. She was an MP and she fought for child benefit, which now, of course, is gone. I think it's all been merged into universal credit and gone. It was very important to get it, mm -hmm. but it was welfare feminism rather than the fierce, fire-breathing feminism of the earlier period. And I think that what's happened now is that the, the refugees and the rape crisis centers and so on, if they do any feminism at all, are doing welfare feminism. It's looking after women and children. The messages of about allowing uh, women and girls to escape, to escape from men, have all gone. Lesbians and feminists um, set them up, but that now is completely gone. So we can have something like a rape crisis center in Scotland, having a, a man running it as long as he wears a dress and so on, and women not being able to actually talk to other women because men who transgender are seen as being perfectly reasonable women to be working and doing this welfare feminism. Um, so, yes, I think that there's a, there's a bit of a version of that, but, uh, but I'm not sure that that's... Um, it, it, is it exactly was the main way, of, but yes, there was, there was, we're seen as anti-sex, that's true. Um, we're seen as old fashioned believers in biology. We're seen mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, so that there's some, some elements of, of the attack um, are similar, I guess. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah. It always strikes me that, um, they, you know, so, you know, feminists from earlier times are often attacked. If, for instance, there, there are some aspects um, that may be seen to be um, racist or, or eugenicist. And, and, it's, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be criticised for that. But male writers of the time that also reflected those very current cultural um, sort of views are excused so we can still study them. They're not seen as outdated, even though they had these outdated you know, they're not condemned for old fashioned language. You know, we, we, you know, philosophy still includes the Greeks from thousands of years ago, but somehow these women from the 19th century are seen as too outdated and old fashioned to, to be included. It, it's, it's quite bizarre. And, and some of the men, as they, you know, there, there was some philosopher that actually joined the Nazi party, but he's still taken seriously. You know, yes. <laughs> I, th I think you are very wise in, in seeing that, Dorothea, because the fact is, Freud, who was dreadful, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> and of course, Freud was a sexologist, mm -hmm. and all the other sexologists were in touch with him, and they all shared their ideas, mm -hmm. um, and I mean, Freud, uh, for instance, was involved in working with other men to deal with um, women's um, and the, the, the solution for apparently for heavy periods um, was removing a bone in the nose. 
And, you know, there was an occasion when Freud's friend had actually done that, the nose bone operation, and had left a yard of gauze in the nose and had to get Freud in to try and help him stop this woman bleeding and mm. save her life and so on. And, of course, Freud said things like women mm. knit because they want to um, create um, a blanket to cover the area that shows they don't have a penis, so they knit to create pubic hair. And so on. I mean, Freud was horrendous. He's taught... Yeah. <laughs> Other women we are talking about are not known. They've been absolutely buried. Yeah. And and that's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, yeah. men always have a canon of their sort of forebears, men who have said things before, yeah. like socialists do. They have, you know, all mm. these men that you're supposed to read. I read them at university. Mm. I didn't yeah. read a single woman in my political th theory course. I did three years of it. I never read a woman. Right. I read all of these men, they are worshipped, they are revered, mm. they are seen as an important part of history, even if they got a few things wrong, you still have mm. to know about them because they're significant. We yeah, know yeah. nothing about these women. So you're absolutely yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, and that is so, you know, so it's so important that, you know, we, we are able to rediscover these women and, and hopefully we'll carry on discovering, them. maybe, you know, there's probably other women we, we don't know about as well um, and, and, share, and sharing this. I mean, um, if you want to know more about Freud, read, uh, you know, Kate Millett's Sexual Politics has a, a good, uh, you know, good section on how Freudianism was used against uh, against yes. women. Yes. Um, you, you know, read, read that. Don't read, don't read Freud. Or, but, you know, but again, there's some there's some women that have called themselves feminists that have tried to use Freud's theories as a as a feminist theory, isn't there? Which I've I've always found very very bizarre. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we're getting towards the the end now. I mean, there's been some really good comments um, in the in the chat section. Women really, you know, appreciating finding out of, about these women. Just wonder if there's anything, any final thoughts that you you had about you know how how we can use this knowledge to help us on the way forward. Yes, I mean, I think that something we have just touched upon is the fact that the current um revolution of um men's cross-dressing of transvestism trying to make them into a human rights bearing category and, and pretend that they're women and so on that is quite specific to this particular backlash so obviously mm -hmm. backlashes take slightly different forms mm -hmm. and the one against women's liberation movement was much more similar i think to the one in the 1920s mm -hmm. which is seeing women as anti-sex and attacking them as anti-sex um, whereas these days, I think sometimes some people are a bit you know, sus suspicious of the sexual revolution. There are young women saying they don't want to have sex and there's a sort of movement against what's going on. Um, so that's not exactly the only thing that's happening now, but the, the, uh, the revolution of transvestism is crucial. That, and that mm. is the real movement against women, because if you can el eliminate the fact that women even have a separate existence and eliminate mm. existence of the word and mm. make it impossible for women to talk about themselves and feminism impossible, mm. that's a really, really um, effective ploy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if there's no women, you can't have a movement to liberate women, can you? Because they absolutely, don't exist. Absolutely. It's the, oh, I mean, it's so, it's so terrifying, but so clever. Of, of them. Yeah. It's, it's extremely clever. I think it's much cleverer, in fact, than any of the backlashes we've seen in the past. Yeah, but but we will we will prevail. That's what we need to remember. There's you know however many hundreds of us that you know that we said earlier. There's, there's a lot of us here. There's a lot of us that are rethinking. And I have seen some more hope. As you say some more hopeful things from younger women and things starting to creep out more into the into the mainstream that are challenging this so let's hope that the the tide has turned so um yeah so it's nearly nearly time to uh, to wrap up so i just want to say thank you very much for to sheila for sharing her knowledge about these women thank you to everybody that's coming and thank you to everybody from wdi that's been working in the background to make all this happen so thank you everybody Yes, and thank you for letting me talk about this book again. I mean, it is 37 years ago that it was written, mm. and it's wonderful that there is an interest in yeah. these things again. Yeah. So in that sense, all is not lost. No, it's still very, very relevant today. Absolutely. So go, go out and read it and Sheila's other books. They're all good. <laughs>